Well, thank you, Warwick, for inviting me along here today. Um, I'm not sure it's a pleasure standing up here talking to you guys, but um, I'll do my best. I don't actually like the word coexistence. I think it's, that indicates just tolerating each other. I think it's a lot more than that. You know, we've got to look at it as a business partnership, and I think if we can start talking about a business partnership, a lot of the stress will disappear when the companies turn up, and you know, the commission should be called the Business Partnership Commission or something, or because it's it, you know it, it it isn't it isn't reflecting what's happening out there today with people that have who want to um, and are prepared to to deal with the the gas industry on their property. So um, I think this. Paul said a little while ago, it's probably nearly 18 years ago we started on this journey. So that, that's a, a long time that um, we've been talking gas and learning about gas. So I came from England in 1980 for a holiday, and I'm still here. Um, here we're cotton, grain, shortly gas, and, um, and then looking at carbon. So the only thing people know about cotton is it uses a lot of water. The only thing people know about coal seam gas is you frack and it's terrible. But I'm hoping when I say I'm a carbon farmer, someone will hug me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've um, always had a, a philosophy of sustainability on our farms. Every year there's numerous research sites, trials, chemicals, varieties, all sorts of um, people on our property. We want to identify and adopt the latest technology and have really been focused on that from the first day we started farming. We've, um, as Cecile said, we've signed up our first CCAs with Arrow and that was a, a really good process. Um, we felt we were project managers and I think we should charge for them, that, that job we did. But we had yeah, basically total control over the design on our properties. There was no pressure, there was no we are going to do this. The word no was never, ever used by Arrow or us. It was, right, oh, we'll sort that out. Yes, we'll do that. We'll move this. We'll fit it in with your tram lines. It was a really good process, and um, we were very, very pleased the way it went. And it's really good to finally be actually doing the negotiations and working with the company, because I spent you know, 10 or 15 years talking about it. Now I'm actually finally living it, and we're very pleased to be living it. Um, so. Yeah, compensation is good. Where it is going to be really important for our businesses during the droughts. You know, we just come through the 1920 drought with virtually no income, and we just needed something to help us through those difficult periods. <clears throat> and this will do. We'll do that. And um, you know, for us, the future looks bright. It's great for my kids. You know, they're it's helping them set them up in business. It's um, the first thing my son did the day we signed the CCA was increase our staff's wages, which I thought was pretty good. And the first thing I did was ring the bank manager and say, you better cut my risk margin because I'm less risky now. <laughs> so I think the one person that had really changed my views on the gas industry was Martin McVicker. This was probably back in about 2010. Took a, about half a dozen of us out to view the origin. Um, Gas development, we learned about you know, well construction, fracking, RO, injection. But we, the first time someone has really taken us out and said, this is what we do. And you know, we just learned from, from Martin and his team how professional they were, how passionate they were, and how skilled they were. And it, it really started to build a bit of confidence in us that we could actually work with this industry. And I guess from an early early stage I had the view that the gas belongs to the community. I don't have the right to say no, but I have the right to say yes, but you must address these issues and you know, it has to be sustainable. And the other person that um, had a big influence on me I guess would be Peter Thompson. He was one of the first people to really talk about coexistence and working with industry and the company to make it work on his property. So he was sort of stand, really standing out on his own at that early stage. Um, what I'm going to present now is a presentation I did for BSA back in 2011, and it just gives a history of what we were asking for and what we've got today. So, 
So I think one of the greatest things we did at Basin Sustainability Alliance was identify the key issues that needed to be addressed before we would say yes. And, um, and, and they're there, and I think they, the, you know, groundwater was the key one for us. It really was something that um, we were all concerned about because we, we just didn't know enough about what would happen to our, well, in our case, the condomine alluvium. It sits directly above the coal seams and we weren't sure about the, the risk, the separation, the risk of connectivity, et cetera. And, you know, social impacts of, you know, we were, people were being stressed. There's no question there was a lot of stress out there. Um, pressure being put on people. You know, we're hearing stories of compensation being a couple of cartons of stubbies and things like that, which I'm not sure it was true or not, but it made good story. And, um, yeah, the old fracking, that was always a good story. So, uh, so um, yeah, this is what we we were saying back then in 2010-11, which um, it took a fair bit of getting based on Sustainability Alliance to to this level, because basically we had six people that had been with Martin McVicker and six people that were probably in the anti-camp, and it was quite interesting discussions around the table, and to actually come up with something positive uh, took a bit of work, but this is, you know, basically we wanted a, an industry that didn't destroy our environment. I think that's... Um, what we really focused on back at that time. So, the, you know, our concerns were about how it's going to affect our business. You know, wells, we, we didn't know a lot about it. Loss of efficiency, reduced ag input. You know, and I guess the, the big thing for us was the frustration and loss of certainty because it, it was quite slow. We were hearing all these stories, but things were moving very slowly. And, um, yeah, our future wasn't certain. We didn't really know what was around the corner for us. had a pretty big impact on our life. I mean, you know, the amount of time and effort people put into researching, going to meetings, I mean, I, over the years, been to hundreds and hundreds of meetings, driven thousands of kilometres. But, you know, we had to get this right, so I was prepared to put the effort in. Um, and I think, you know, what people did focus on was a loss of freedom on your property. You suddenly got uninvited guests on your property. You know, how are we going to handle that? We, we've never had this before. Um, you know, loss of security as people wandering around your farm all the time. Haven't had that before, leaving gate open, all sorts of things. And obviously the compulsory acquisition type thing really, really um, upset people. Um, you know, we had no right to say no and, and that was very difficult for people. So actually when I looked at this slide, which this presentation I hadn't looked at for 10 years, I smiled at this one. The... Um, mandatory requirement for a, a VAT at adding value to our business, that I thought was pretty good. And um, the Queensland Country Life Test, I think that is um, a really good one. And we are seeing properties advertised with gas infrastructure on them. But it's interesting, there's very few are changing hands. So is that must be a good sign that these guys are sustainable. They're not having to sell up in droughts. And I mean, I don't know what the you know, real reason, but it, there's you know, it's only one or two a year that seem to be on the market. So that's probably, I think, is a good sign, a positive sign. Um, and I guess the reason we were prepared to put a lot of effort into making sure this industry was truly sustainable is because we, we faced all these issues. You know, over allocation of the Murray Darling and the cost to communities right through the system of the buyback. Um, you know, the condomine alluvium has been over allocated and we've lost 60% of our water, or close to 60% of our water. I mean, that hurts. That was the only guaranteed water we had. You know, the tree clearing guidelines, we, we've cleared too many trees. Now there's clawing back and it's probably gone back in some places too far the wrong way. So there's plenty of examples out there of why we had to get this right and why we put the effort in at the early stage to ensure this industry did go down that sustainable path. Um, Central Downs Irrigators had obviously concern about groundwater and we commissioned John Hillier to do a report into the risk of connectivity and basically comes up and says that, you know, we, we haven't got enough knowledge. We don't, don't really know the whole story. And when we look at, you know, mo um, monitoring of our bores, how are you going to pick up that 10% of the water's disappearing from the Condamine into the Walloon coal measures. It's, you know, we just couldn't see how this could be done, how, how are we going to actually assess the risk. 
And um, you know, the make good provisions, when they were first spoke about, and this is probably in Anna Bly's day, and she used to talk about adaptive management, and we used to call it suck it and see, and that really scared us as well. And you know, we just weren't sure there was going to be other aquifers available for, for water for these people if we lost our water. So um, yeah, that, that raised a lot of concerns with people. Um, yeah, there's examples of salt. I think it's Mooney, uh, Mooney. There's old petroleum evaporation ponds still blowing salt around the environment. And in the early days, there was going to be millions of tons of salt produced, and there wasn't really a, a plan to to manage it. And when we went with Martin and looked at reverse osmosis and concentrating the salt and using the water for productive purposes, that that really we thought that you know that's the way to do it. We need to um, need to support this. So these are our comments from 10 years ago. You know, maintain the local water balance. I mean, we've just got to do that. Water's so important. You know, Re-injection. We actually you know, started talking about the groundwater substitution project 10, 11 years ago. That came from, you know, directly from us at BSA. And, and using the water in area of extraction. I mean, if we could, that would be brilliant. I mean, the vision back then was all this water would be treated, put back in the ground and available for industries in 10 or 20 years' time when the gas industry leaves the area. We've got a lot of infrastructure, a lot of very skilled people. Let's try and work out how we keep them in our in our region. So, um, you know, we have learned over time that you can't inject everywhere and you can't do a lot of it. But, you know, it would have been good to start again and have that as as the plan is to leave a legacy of a few million megalitres of water underground for future industries and and businesses. And um, you know, we've seen a. You know, new irrigation farms developed, which is a great use of the water, but it's it is short term. I mean, it's great for the guys that got the water, but um, you know, it's not really providing for future generations. So what we said back then: invest in credible science, cooperative research centres. You know, Queensland Water Commission. This is days before Ogier even was mentioned, but um, and then you know, identify um, beneficial. Water plans. It's, let's look at using this water in a, in a beneficial way to to the community and for food production. So we wanted a commitment from the industry, no long-term impacts, and we wanted to work with the government um, and industry to have a benefit, a visionary beneficial water use plan. And I think we've certainly got that with the um, the groundwater substitution scheme that Arrow are involved in. So we reckon back then, 10, 11 years ago, we had one chance to get it right. So that's why we were putting the effort into working with companies and government. And you know, we've got to congratulate the companies and the government for the work they've done. They've listened to what we were saying back there. And um, you know, it's been an incredible journey. It's been, been a long, hard journey. But you know, where we are today, I think we can say the industry is, is, you know, is sustainable. It is doing, you know, we, we understand the risks We've, we're managing the risks, um, and yeah, it, we've we've come a long way and and in a pretty good space right now. So one of the concerns for us on our, in the irrigators on the central downs um, on the Condamine alluvium was the risk of connectivity between the Condamine alluvium and the Walloon coal measures. So this is a research site on our property to um, to monitor that risk. Um, we've got a well that's drilled straight through into the coals, one into the transition zone between the condomine alluvium and the Walloon coal measures and a couple in the, in the condomine alluvium. So this uh, site was, or trial was designed by Ogier and funded by Arrow. And it was a really good project. I really enjoyed spending time down there with the hydros and the drillers and, and learning as much as I could. Um, had a bit of opposition from my neighbours for putting it there, and they weren't very pleased with me. But I think we needed the information. I, you know, I can't keep saying you don't know if I'm not prepared to help gather that information. So we were more than happy to make our farm available for this site. And then there's another site at Graham Clapham's farm at Cecil Plains. And um, one thing I insisted happening here was having a core drill through from the surface through the transition zone into the coals, because a year or two earlier. Um, Ash Geldard and I went to Brisbane to walk along the Origin Core with uh, Andrew Moser and we spent a couple of three hours walking along it and he was explaining 
all the different aquitards, aquifers, injection sites. And when we're at meetings and the company say, oh, there's 30 metres of separation, yeah, what's that? It's nothing, you know. You walk past 30 metres of concrete and think, I'm not sure water's going to get through that. And as a farmer, we need to be able to see this stuff. We need to, be able to touch it, kick it, bite it, whatever. But we need we need to be able to you know physically see it. And and you know at our site, we just looked at all the different sediment layers, and there was a big zone of nice blue thick clay there. And you think, wow, if water gets through that, I'll be very very surprised. So um, yeah, a lot of very valuable information for landholders there. Um, you know, we start and understand about geophysical logging, and we could see the log and see the core sample, and and it just really built confidence in it. And it's being actively monitored continually. Um, there's some good information coming out of it. It's yeah, that is probably, I, I believe, the best investment Arrow has ever made in building relationships with landholders. It, it really took the sting out of us. We couldn't say we don't know because we. <clears throat> We now do know the risks. And so, yeah, over time, the, um, you know, the government put groups together for, to start getting some engagement because 10, 11 years ago, we were only throwing bricks at, bricks at the companies and they're saying, oh, sorry, we'll do better. And I think the first time we actually sat down with the industry was in Ian Fletcher's day. And we had a Dolby Diners Club where we'd sit one side of the table and throw rocks and the poor industry on the other side saying, Sorry, we'll improve. But um, we moved on from there to the Surat Basin Engagement Group, and I think it was the first time we had a, a meet, something similar to this. We had the industry and landholders in a room, and we started talking to each other. And we found out that the um, people in the industry were actually nice people and just as passionate and professional about their industry as we were about ours. So that was really good. And then we moved on to Gasfields Commission, and, and Warwick has spoken about that and the great job they've done. And... I certainly really enjoyed my first term with, with John Cotto and we're getting out in the sticks and talking to people because you talk, start talking to someone and they're anti-gas and you start saying, well, no, hang on, why? How about you look at it as a business opportunity and in space of half an hour you get someone from locking the gate thinking, hmm, perhaps I need to reconsider my, my views and it's just people's, you know, they just, the stress went out of them and they just started thinking, well, maybe it's not so bad after all and that was, yeah, that was a lot of fun and pleasure in doing that with people. So I, I spoke earlier about Ogier, and I think that is the really the greatest thing to come out of this industry. Um, I know John Hillier said that, you know, the um, Surat Basin, now, the community management area, is probably the best understood aquifer system in the world. And, um, you know, the work that Randall Cox has done and now Sanjeev, I think it's just, it is incredible, you know, the work on on um, identifying bores for make good and just understanding water flows. Yeah, you just, we couldn't have wished for more. We asked for this 10, 11 years ago, and I think what we've got is, is quite brilliant. I think one of the things that have come out of it and we probably haven't made as much use of as we should as landholders is the groundwater net, you know, giving landholders a chance to, to check their own standing water levels. I think Origin were actually helping fund some of that work, and I think it's, it's a shame it was never picked up by our peak bodies and, and we should have every groundwater user in the state having one bore that's monitored to so they understand groundwater movement because so many places groundwater levels are dropping and it's nothing to do with gas, it's just local consumption. And, uh, you know, we've got the compliance unit out there which has obviously helped. There's a, there was a, that was very important in the early days. People said there's nobody's listening. Well, someone was listening and they were out there helping people work through it all. And I mean, got to congratulate the companies. Gee whiz, you got some bloody good staff, some really nice people to deal with. You know, professional. Whether it's in the in the meeting rooms, where they're doing presentations on the industry, answering our questions about concerns we have, or the staff in our field out in the field. There's a great bunch of people you've got working for you, and I really congratulate you for the the people you're selecting, and the um, especially the field staff. The the power they've got, or they've got the you know the um, the opportunity to 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 change design or go back to <clears throat> the engineers in Brisbane and say, look, the farmer wants this to happen, wants that to happen, and it happens. So, yeah, it's it's a big change from what we're hearing in the early days. And we've um, you know got the 
land access ombudsman as well to help people that have got the CCAs and feel they've got issues out there. There's someone they can go to, which I think, again, is very important. It's giving you know, power back to the landholder, which is important. And, um, yes, yeah, so Seal spoke about the you know, community reference group and the intensive farmland group. Oh, brilliant. The work that our have done there is second to none. And I used to go out to the Santos Origin Water Working Group out at Roma because it was a more mature industry and I wanted to hear what was going on out there. And I'd drive three hours out to Roma and sometimes I'm the only landholder in the room and I'm thinking, gee, these guys are doing a bloody good job because people would sooner be at home farming than coming along and identifying issues that need to be addressed or, or, um, or you know, got some serious concerns about the industry. So, so that was an eye-opener and, and learned a bit more about you know, how things are being done in, in another area and found that very valuable. Um, yes, as Seal spoke about, um, you know, field visits, farm, you know, go and have a look at the sites. And there's nothing better than, and as you did with um, our research site, have a time-lapse photography. So you just see it go from, you know, greenfield site to a completed um, research site and all, all the action in between. And, and I often think that we look at a project halfway through and it's basically a mess. It's the same as having house renovations, halfway through it's a mess and you think it's never going to come good, but you've got to look at the whole process and see what it looks like you know, six months after the, um, everything's been done and it's all up and operational. And I think that's um, when we can visit sites that have been developed, it does help you. And, and some have seen, um, you know, some of the camps that have been rehabbed, you know, several hundred man camps with gravel roads and lights and everything there, go back a year later and it's just grass paddock and you think that's not... How do they do that? You know, just amazing. Couldn't even find a, a rock on the ground from the gravel. Um, you know, we are talking fair compensation these days, which is good. You know, it has to be something in it for us, as we're not going to do it. Um, as much as I know the asset belongs to the state and I want everybody to share in it, I want a little bit of it too. And, um, yeah, the BUN committee, so see we're talking about, that's the Beneficial Use Network Committee, which um, Arrow have engaged with... Um, Central Downs Irrigators, so it's a very open and transparent process to to go through and um, and when and to select the people that will be involved in substituting their groundwater. So we'll leave our bore water in the ground and we'll receive um, treated water be piped into our storages. And there's some issues for us. I mean, we're going to lose capacity with this lands. This water's um, going to be evaporating away or potentially evaporating away. We might have to invest in another storage, but. The long-term benefit of this is great for our community and we're happy to put something back into our community and I think everybody involved in it you know, views that. We've got to protect the condomine alluvium and, and you know, potentially have some water, some extra water available for the future. And recent issues, the public liability insurance, we got caught up, WFI dumped us because we're going to have gas wells. Um, it took me one phone call to find another company that's happy to take us on and our insurance manager work for Origin, so he understands the industry, so that's a, a double plus as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've probably got a better public liability cover now. It cost us probably three times as much as our previous one, but the overall package saved us about 20% on cost, so we're, we're pretty happy with that. And I talk to him regularly about residual risk and liability, and he says that... Um, providing we have a good relationship with the company and, and manage our farm as it's ours, the, the residual risks should be very, very low or minimal. Absent subsidence has been raised as an issue recently. Um, yeah, it, it, there's a risk, small risk. There's a greater risk probably from subsidence from the condomine alluvium. So we've got to put that in perspective. But we are having a subsidence monitoring site on our farm because we need to know. And um, my only concern, I guess, is with make good boards. We've got one on our property and the residual risk is passed back to the landholder and I think that's wrong. I know it's incredibly low risk of something going wrong, but it would cost a million bucks or more to fix if it went wrong and I don't want to come up with that. So I think that's a, that the government should carry that risk, not me. And I'll keep fighting for that one. And, um, yeah, promotes this year's of business. I think our peak bodies need to have a better relationship with the gas industry and, and um, you know, manage and issues and, you know, in the office, not in the public. 
I think there's, especially this liability thing could blow out of all proportion. So let's, let's start doing this stuff behind the scenes. Um, better government reporting of audit and compliance, just build confidence with us. And I was always in favour of standard CCI to, because I think that process is abused by some lawyers. Um, haven't been successful in getting that. But, yeah, I'll leave that to somebody else to worry about that one day. Eh? So, yeah, conclusion. In 12, well, I think about 18 years of hard work, but anyway. And, um, you know, I, I think we're well on the road to achieving our goal from this presentation 10 years ago. So, thank you very much. <laughs>